Okay, so lesson six and lesson seven will be covered today, and this is the end of unit three. So for lesson six, we're gonna be looking at how genes are controlled and expressed. So when we finished last week, if you recall, we looked at some things called the um, introns, exons, uh, the genes that are responsible, coding, non-coding genes, and how they are spliced out depending on their need and depending on what's needed by that cell and it's kind of the way that we can look at making those millions of proteins uh, despite only having that specific set or combination of genome so we can start to see how proteins are formed after the fact with regards to that translation of that dna to rna to protein so not all proteins are needed by cells at all time this is kind of an underrated component so again, when we think about the waste of a cell and how good they are at making things efficient, we're looking at minimizing that wasting of resources. So we're gonna control the expressions of genes as a response to the environment. And now this is where we start to compare biology to some other aspects of science because the, the key component of biology up till now that we've learned has been everything that's going on in the cell, the cell, the cell, the cell. How can the cell make and store and control the different things that are going on. Well, now we're gonna to start to look at how the environment itself can impact the way that that works. So when we think about the prokaryotic cell and how prokaryotic cells control that gene expression, you really have to realize that in prokaryotic cells, there are no nucleus, no nucleus whatsoever. So the DNA is in that cytosol. So when you think about that control of genetic expression or gene expression, Prokaryotes base, uh, the control in prokaryotes based on concentration of only two molecules, lactose and tryptophan. And you'll, you'll realize those two things. Lactose is the key component of milk and dairy products. Tryptophan is the key component for meat and uh, meat-based protein products. And it's controlled by a group of genes and promoters that are collectively known as operons. And these operons are kind of like the operators of a system, so to speak. And they look at how that genetic expression can be controlled. So both examples dem demonstrate something called negative feedback loops, which is a common theme that we've, that we've explored in previous units, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. As you know, I like to combine aspects of what we've learned in this unit to the previous learnings. I'll be doing that a lot more this week. Those products inhibit the initial process. So the more of those products that are produced the more likely it's going to inhibit the production of those products at a later date, those negative feedback loops that we've looked at. And we've only looked at it in the context of enzymes, but now we're gonna connect it all to the genetic components of a cell. So the LAC operon, the LAC operon is a group of genes that are responsible for lactose metabolic processes within that cell. And lactose is a sugar that that cell uses for energy. So just like we utilize glucose for our metabolic processes, in these prokaryotic cells that we're gonna look at, we're looking at lactose as a main component. So how does the lac operon work? Well, the lac operon works in that it's going to work in terms of that repressor. So that repressor component of the lac operon, it's going to bind to what's called an operator and it's going to prevent transcription of that specific gene or gene sequences from happening. So when you think about absence of lactose within the cell environment, there's no lactose whatsoever in the cell's environment. And so as a result of that lactose lack, why would the cell want to produce the enzyme that is responsible for breaking that lactose down? Because there's no reason there's no reason why that cell would make those proteins and use those resources to break down lactose if it's not present, it's not present in the cytosol. So that operator region has a repressor that's bound to it and it prevents that transcription of that lac operon or that the genes responsible for that metabolic process of lactose. So the enzymes aren't there to break down the lactose that isn't there. And, and it's a very efficient use of, of the, the cell's resources. Now, that's when the absence of lactose 
is a thing in the cell. What happens once lactose starts to get come into the cell? So the cell now has access to some type of food resource. What type of reaction or what type of response does the cell go through to now it, remove that inhibition to produce the enzyme? So now we have a large quantity of lactose beep, in the cell. And that lactose, if you take a look at the lacropressor, that lacropressor that binds to the operator that prevents that uh, that transcription of that gene set, uh, sequence, that lactose fits nicely into that lacropressor. So when it's active, that lacropressor, when it is active and binds to that operator region to prevent the promotion of that transcription of those genes, that lactose comes in, binds to the lac repressor, it changes the shape of that protein or that enzyme sequence. And as a result of that changing shape, we can now start to see that operator be freed up, the promoter region can now be bound by that RNA polymerase, and now that transcription of that genetic sequence will allow it to make essentially a protein and then enzyme that will break down lactose. So the transcription is allowed to happen, RNA polymerase can do its thing, will turn that gene sequence or those genes of the lac operon, which are required to make the enzyme to break down lactose, it will bind to that region, transcribe it, make that messenger RNA, and the process of protein synthesis can go on as we explored on Friday. So again, the key aspect you need to recognize here is that when lactose is present in the cell, it needs to make the enzymes to break it down. So the presence of lactose will perform that inducer, that inducer role of that um, repressor, and it, it allows for the enzymes to be produced. So lactose is what we call an inducer molecule. Since once it's there in the presence of it, it will help to trigger the actual expression of those genes. And it's going to do that by blocking the repressor. It seems counterintuitive to block something to allow it to be made. But we're, recall, we're talking about the repressor. We're blocking the repressor's ability to function properly. So as the amount of lactose in the cell decreases, so does the transcription of the lac operon. And when you think about why that's the case, eventually when there's no lactose left, the lac operon will be repressed. And, and when we think about that lac operon being repressed again, we're thinking about that lac repressor being activated as a result of no lactose being there. So this is one method with which we call negative feedback loops in that anytime there is a absence of something, we reproduce it less, the, the enzyme is responsible for breaking down that something. And once that something, in this case, lactose is present on mass, it helps to promote the transcription of the, the necessary genes in order to break down that molecule. So that's one way, <coughs> pardon me, that's one way with which we can use negative feedback loops to, to control gene expression. The next one we will look at is the trip operon. And the trip operon are the genes responsible for synthesizing tryptophan, which is an amino acid grouping, which you find in large quantities in meat and meat products. It is very similar to the arrangement and structure of the lac operon, but with a few distinctions. When tryptophan is in fact present in the cell, it will activate the repressor and block transcription. So kind of reverse, right? When lactose is present, it will promote, it will promote that transcription of those genes. However, when tryptophan is present, it will actually activate that repressor and block transcription. So that might be a really good compare and contrast question, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, when we look at comparing two different feedback loops of prokaryotic cells. So when tryptophan is absent, the repressor protein is inactive. So therefore, when tryptophan is needed, meaning when there's an absence of it in the cell, the cell will make it. When tryptophan is there in high quantities, the cell will not make it, and it will in fact repress that trip operon. So those are two ways in which prokaryotic cells are able to control their gene expression. Uh, and so when we think about the comparison to the tryptophan being present or not present within the cell, again, it's pretty much the same as that lac operon. However, we're looking at it, it's when we need to make that tryptophan, the absence of tryptophan within the cell, the absence of tryptophan in the cell, will cause the trip repressor to be inactive. 
meaning it will allow for that genetic in, uh, information to be transcribed to make tryptophan because again, that repressor is inactive, cannot bind to the operator, so transcription will continue. This mRNA is made continuously and it will contain that info on making tryptophan in protein synthesis. So lack of tryptophan, we need to make that molecule. It needs that amino acid. It's gonna make it, all that, uh, that operon will be transcribed, production of tryptophan can ensue. If it's present, if it's present in the cell environment, we don't wanna make tryptophan. We wanna stop, in fact, making tryptophan. So that tryptophan will act as a co-repressor. And the reason I say it acts as a co-repressor is that it will bind to that trip repressor and stop transcription. But as tryptophan is used by the cell, the concentration will decrease, and then that repressor will be inactive. So you need the presence of both the uh, trip repressor as well as tryptophan to work as what's called a co-repressor in conjunction, the two of them work together to repress that reaction. It's gonna shape, change that shape of that trip repressor, allow it to bind to the operator, and then it will prevent that tryptophan from being created. As a result, it blocks transcription. So the key thing here to realize is that in prokaryotes, the cell will directly monitor concentration and it will respond immediately to those concentration changes, simply because the DNA is floating around in the cytosol. The lack of a nucleus has pros and cons. In this case, prokaryotes can respond immediately to changes in concentrations of any type of molecule. So if it needs to make more lactase or that enzyme that breaks down lactose, or it needs to make more tryptophan or make less tryptophan, it can respond quite quickly to it due to the lack of a nucleus. So that's how prokaryotes control gene expression. We're now going to look at eukaryotic control of gene expression, because as you guessed, it's gonna be a little bit different due to the fact that a nucleus exists. And there are several stages from DNA to end result of protein that need to kind of take place as well. So due to that complexity of gene expression in eukaryotes, when we look at that central dogma aspect that we need to think about, there's going to be many more steps. And, and there are no operons within that eukaryotic cell. And eukaryotes DNA is restricted to that nucleus. So we do not have the direct concentration having an impact on whether a gene is expressed or not. So there's gonna be four categories of gene expression control in eukaryotes. The first is that, that transcriptional regulation. It's gonna regulate which one of those genes are in fact transcribed and at the, at the rate that they're going to be transcribed. It's very specialized in that context. It's very specialized. And we can recall that idea that DNA is organized into chromosomes and they are tightly wound using that histone protein. So the rate with which that information gets unwound and transcribed and then translated, it's a little bit slower. So they have to develop these specialized components that look for specific markers. So when we think about that specific gene that needs to be transcribed, the DNA within that specialized section needs to be unwound and then looked at being transcribed and translated because you can't just do the whole thing when you think about how much information there is, it needs to be highly, highly, highly specialized in order to be done properly. So the gene of interest is that needs to be transcribed is effectively in green and then eventually in that red component of the wound DNA. And in order for that DNA to kind of be activated, it's going to have to be unwound. So only opens a small section, not the whole strand, because if you think about how much energy is responsible for unwinding an entire strand of DNA that's wound around histone, it, it's too much information, right? It's too much information to do all of it. So it only does the specific chunk that needs to be transcribed. And this allows that RNA polymerase to bind to that promoter and then transcribe that specific sequence into messenger RNA. So another useful control mechanism that we're gonna discuss briefly is the idea that um, methylation or a CH4 group, that hydrocarbon that we kind of looked at, I'm sorry, CH2 group that we kind of looked at in, uh, in some aspects of unit one when we looked at the general molecules that we're gonna be discussing in this class. Uh, this methylation or a methyl CH2 group is added to bases in the promoter region of that gene. So that RNA polymerase cannot bind to that specific region. 
And this is what's called silencing. This silencing of that specific gene or that region as a result of methylation prevents that DNA from being, from being transcribed. This method can also be used by cells to kind of put certain genes on hold. And, and in specific cells where the gene isn't really needed by that cell, it doesn't need to make that, that protein or express that gene at all. So it kind of silences specific uh, components of, of that gene, depending on the cell that it's in. And the cells, again, I'm, this is like a very broad general component of what it actually does, but it's so heavily specialized that it is absolutely incredible when it comes to which cells know what to make more of or make less of as a result of that. So when you think about how cool, how specialized it is, and then you think about environmental factors, uh, like uh, bisphenol A, which is shown to kind of demethylate specific genes and turn them on un unnecessarily. That, that BPA, which is a chemical that's found in many plastics, or you know, not as much as it used to be, but it used to be found in many plastics, um, it, it really activated some genes that didn't really need to be activated. Uh, so the example that I'll talk about are the agouti mice. When you look at the left lighter mice color, it's got active agouti genes. And then the right, which is a darker mice, has deactivated genes, AKA quote unquote normal. And it's interesting to, to think about it in terms that they have identical DNA, right? That's my main point that I wanna try to make with this. It's identical, their DNA is 100% identical. You cannot sequence both of those mice and find a single difference about their genome. However, some of their genes are activated more so than the others. The, the active, the light, lighter color happens when those agouti genes are activated as opposed to the darker ones. So again, when you think back to grade 11 biology, I always tell my students, you know, like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm kind of lying to you with how regards to how this actually works. It's not as simplified as we make it seem in grade 11, simply because you can have identical genomes, specific, that specific gene responsible for color can be identical to another mice's genome, but they can have two different expressions as a result of it. And again, I'll tell you this right now, folks, uh, some of this stuff that I am teaching you with regards to gene expression, it's not 100% how it actually works, right? It's just the simplified version with which we discuss it for your understanding now. Uh, there are a million other factors that contribute to some aspects. So uh, take it with your understandings that you need to take away right now, but also recognize that it's not the full picture of how it all works. So that was the first method that we looked at in terms of how genes are controlled in eukaryotic cells. Now we're going to look at the post-transcriptional regulation. And we kind of talked a little bit about that with regards to controls on the availability of mRNA to that ribosome. And it's based on changes that are made to that pre-mRNA. So it controls how much expression we see from an mRNA. So the cell might actually make that messenger RNA en masse because it feels like it needs to make whatever specific protein groups or whatever specific enzymes. Uh, but there are some aspects of, of post-transcriptional regulation that control the expression of that protein or the uh, RNA. So when we look at alternative splicing, we're looking at combining different exons by removing introns to control the final protein. So again, that idea that you can remove some stuff after that DNA has been transcribed and an attempt to alter that final protein. And again, it's hyper simplified, but there are methods with which controlling alternative splicing allows for that broad diversity of proteins and that broad diversity of enzymes that we as a species benefit from despite only having that uh, maximal amount of gene and gene regulations. There's also binding proteins within animal eggs. These binding proteins on messenger RNA prevent that translation until the egg is fertilized. So the cell, specifically the DNA, will transcribe all this genetic information, but the cell in some way, shape, or form via binding proteins that are found in eggs will say, okay, look, we don't need to make feathers or we don't need to make wings. I'm using a chicken as an example or the um, lungs just quite yet. So we're gonna use these binding proteins to connect to that genetic information that's responsible for making all of those different organs and systems and, and features, and we'll close those guys down until that egg is fertilized and until, that, uh, until we get to a stage where that cell or those cells now need to start developing more specific 
and specialized systems. So those binding proteins in animal eggs, they kind of tell the genes to like, hey, 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 hold your horses. We'll get to that stuff later, but thank you for making that right now. And then the last thing is the change to the rate of degradation of mRNA. We kind of looked at that aspect already with those poly A tails. Uh, in hormone instruction, when we talk about it, and again, I feel like I always bring note to homeostasis, and I promise we'll get to that when we do this this coming week. But when we look at the poly A tail length, the longer the tail, uh, the longer it's going to take for that messenger RNA to degrade because those restriction or those enzymes that are responsible for breaking down messenger RNA in the cytosol, uh, if they have to chew through poly A tails that are super long, it takes a longer time so that that um, that messenger RNA can be translated more so. And when we think about hormone instructions in next unit, I'll touch base on how that connects to it. The third way with which eukaryotic cells kind of get controlled is that translational regulation. It's going to control how often and how quickly that messenger RNA is translated into ribosomes. And the rate of translation, again, may be dependent on those poly A tails. Depending on how long that poly A tail is, depending on how, uh, depending on how long that poly A tail is, the time with which it takes to transcribe it is, or translate it, sorry, will be relative to that. So it's important to recognize that the idea of translation can be controlled with that poly A tail as well. And then looking at post-translational regulation, it's the last control that we'll look at. It controls when that polypeptide chain becomes fully functional protein. So how long they can function and when they are degraded by the cell. So a couple of people asked questions over the weekend, like, hey, enzymes are like recycled. Are they ever like just destroyed or are they ever rebuilt? And yes, sometimes a protein, the, the analogy that I made is, is if you don't follow sports, my apologies. Um, but athletes that play for a really long time, they're still really good at what they do. But just before they retire, or just before they finish playing, the drop off is very stark. And so even though they're like, even though they're performing at like the 90th percentile of what a regular human being can do, it's not quite up to the specifics of what is needed from them from their team. And the coach will be like, hey, you know what? I know you're a little over the hill, but we got to take you out. You can't play anymore. The same thing happens to proteins and enzymes. They're still functioning very well, but it's not quite up to the specifics of the, what the cell needs. So we're going to look at adding or removing parts of that protein to control its activi activity. Um, that's another component to, to consider when we look at that post-translational regulation. So when the protein's not functioning, it, it basically gets broken down. We can add and remove parts from that protein to help control its activity. We can modify it chemically with regards to the addition of, oops, with regards to the addition of uh, non-protein groups, those allosteric enzyme regulations where we look at additions of non-protein structures to kind of help control the way that that protein works. And then finally, we have that degradation that I talked about. It is tagged with a chemical called ubiquitin, and it sends that protein to then be recycled by the lysosome structure of the cell. And then in my example, I have pepsinogen can be activated by turning it into pepsin. You learned about pepsinogen and pepsin in grade 11 biology. Uh, it's activated by that pH change, and that pH change kind of cuts off a part of the protein and allows for it to activate. And the last thing I want to talk about with regards to uh, activation of genes or gene expression as a whole is cancer because it is a huge, huge, huge component with regards to uh, gene expression. When you think about cancer and its lack of the regulatory mechanisms to control that uh, that cellular growth or that cellular production of proteins, it's going to be due to that mutation of DNA over time. So those healthy cells contain those set of cells that are closely regulated and they only make the necessary proteins when they need them. However, in cancer cells, that genetic information for, uh, for all intents and purposes on what's called an oncogene are mutated. And those oncogenes are responsible for telling the gene or telling the cell to effectively grow and reproduce as rapidly and as quickly as possible. And it gives rise to that unspecialized cell because all of those cells and genes, or all those genes that are responsible for making those proteins that will perform function or break down a specific thing, all of those proteins are now being hijacked uh, from that mutated oncogene. 
and they're just being utilized to grow and make more cells. So that's what we have. That's when we start to see tumors arise as a result. And that tumor suppressor gene essentially, which is activated. Okay, that's it for this lesson. I know there was a question. I'll, I'll scroll back to that and I'll answer that question in a second. Um, but please folks, just take a look at this section 7.4 and work through some of those problems and readings as well as uh, reviewing some of the notes. There's a bit of information with regards to this lesson, uh, but it ties into everything we've kind of learned already. So I'll stop recording here and I will answer questions.